Great. Well, wonderful to see all of you this afternoon on a, um, a day before it gets really cold, apparently. But I'm enjoying the transition to fall, as I know you all are, but certainly heartbroken by the firefighters that we're experiencing. And of course, it comes in a year that's crazy anyway, 2020, and including the, this election cycle. Um, we in Colorado are um, contending with you know, separate from the national elections, we have a US Senate election and state legislative races that are really important to the sort of the, the future look of our state and state ballot questions and want to give a shout out to uh, Louise and Tricia and thank them again for their awesome work in collaborating and pulling together and, and many on this call were a part of that process and in, in building our position on ballot questions um, over the course of the last couple of months. All, when, we're, when Ed and I are done with this part of the conversation, we'll ask uh, Louise and um, Tricia to share any thoughts and updates on progress on those ballot questions. But, um, but of course the landscape, as I mentioned, is, is uh, a bit volatile right now. I've invited Ed C. Lover, who is with the Denver Business Journal, has been a political reporter for what, 17 years, Ed? Uh, tech in Colorado, I've been covering the state legislature for 14 years. 14 years. Okay, so 14 years he's been covering Colorado politics in the state legislature. Um, and I've known him for, I think, all of those years. And I have always found him to be um, a very thoughtful um, reporter and one of the few that really is reporting on business issues and so consequently really understands the interconnect between business concerns, the policies, and the politics that are in play. So. Um, always appreciate the time he spends to share perspective. Some of you may have joined us um, soon after the end of the legislative session where he shared um, some post-mortem um, thoughts on the past, on the session and uh, really unique insights on that odd and unique session that we experienced. But now we look forward and while the outcome of the, legis of the elections isn't isn't quite clear, of course. We have, what, two weeks left, uh, two weeks minus a day left to go. No, two weeks today. Yes, two weeks today left to go. Um, we have a pretty good pull, I think, on what we might see here in Colorado legislatively. And so I wanted Ed to provide um, some prognostication, perhaps, and then also discuss with us what the future legislature might mean for business in this upcoming year. We left it on a pretty rocky note for business out of 2020 and anticipate um, um, additional rockiness, but his thoughts on what that looks like and then I'll weigh in. So this will be a bit of a conversation and certainly we'll open it to conversation um, once we've had our initial thoughts shared. So Ed, wanna thank you again so much for your joining us today. Thank you, thanks for having me on and, and thanks for everyone who's, who's tuning in because I realized that the number of people, even people who are dedicated to following the issues and following politics, who, uh, but the number of people who are following the state legislative races this year is, is almost infinitesimal because it's so overwhelmed by the national scene right now. But uh, as, as, as I always talk to, to Sandra about when I'm covering the legislature, I'm covering the business issues there, it, these are just as important, if not more important Important in many ways than the, 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 the national races that we're watching right now. Um, and I think there is a lot to be determined um, in, in what's going to happen uh, in the 2021-2022 session because of, of what happens at these elections. Um, so uh, for those of you who, who don't uh, spend every waking hour watching uh, the legislature like Senator and I do, um, I'll set the stage here. Uh, there are uh, 35 senators, 65 state representatives. Uh, Democrats hold a 19 to 16 edge in the Colorado Senate. And in fact, they just took back over the Senate in the 2018 election after four years of Republicans being in charge. They hold a much wider 41 to 24 edge in the Colorado House. And it is those differences in the margin that has really produced two different types of chambers, even though they're held by the same party over the past two years. The Colorado House has put through a lot of policies that business has fought tooth and nail. Um, with, with very little change in the way those policies are coming out of the House, uh, the Colorado Senate um, has been in many ways a backstop uh, for, for businesses fighting against some of the things coming out of the House. Um, 
whether it has been uh, a chamber that has killed issues. Um, and uh, I think the most notable one of these is the Paid Family Medical Leave Act, um, which has gone down uh, or has not been introduced for seven straight years in, um, because of the Senate. Uh, and that's even the Senate with Democratic control over the past two years, um, uh, or, has, um, or has just modified bills that have come out of it. And so, um, I think the way to look at this election is that the Democrats will continue to hold both the House and the Senate come January. What is key about how business issues will be affected is the margin that they're playing with. Um, so in the Senate, because uh, that's a lot easier to, to talk about, um, and I'm not sure if it's 17, 18, 19 seats that are up. I'm never sure the exact breakdown of which seats are up every two years there, but about half the seats are up in the Senate this year. Um, and there are really five of them, four or five that are in play. Uh, two of them are Democratic held. Uh, one is the seat held by Rachel, uh, Senator Rachel Zenzinger in the Arvada era. The other uh, may or may not be in play. Most people don't think it is, is the seat held by Senator Jeff Bridges in the Greenwood Village area. Meanwhile, there are three Republican held seats that are up for grabs this year. Uh, one is held by Senator Bob Rankin in the Carbondale area. One of them is held by Senator Kevin Priola in the Brighton Henderson area. And then one, uh, is vacant after Senator Jack Tate of Centennial decided not to run for re-election. Um, and most guesses put that 1916 uh, margin for the Democrats anywhere between 18, 17, or if they can really uh, go big, you know, 21 or 22 seats uh, in January. And even when I spoke to Majority Leader Steve Fenberg a couple of weeks ago for an article, he admitted, yeah, the margin is going to make a big difference in the kinds of bills you're going to see coming out. And, and here's why. The, the Senate has served as that backstop to a number of bills in recent years um, because of a cadre of moderates uh, at, at its heart. And, and Zenzinger is, I think, no one questioned the leader of those. She is someone who comes from uh, city government, uh, and, and if you know Arvada, a very pro-business city government. Um, and has has stepped in the way of a lot of things. She's been the lead voice saying the, the, the paid family medical leave efforts that had been put through were too much for business. Um, uh, some of those efforts were negotiated, ultimately killed or bumped down to study committees. Now that issue is largely out of the hands of the senators. That's going before the voters as Proposition 118. Um, she stepped up and led the group uh, fighting against House Bill 1420 uh, during the last three weeks of the abbreviated abbreviated post-coronavirus session. Um, that was the bill that would have taken about $1.8 billion worth of business tax credits away and put that toward education spending, uh, got bumped down severely. And most, all of the controversial business tax credits it was looking to end or roll back uh, were taken out of that bill. Um, and in fact, when I talked to her, she said, yeah, look, that is still, those are the things that are still at issue here, depending on the margin. Um, you know, the, what does that cadre of moderates look like going in? Well, you're gonna have Zenzinger, you're gonna have Senator Joanne Janal of Fort Collins, who's up for reelection, but that's, the, no one's contesting that race really. And then Senator James Coleman, Senator-elect James Coleman who's coming over from the house in a, uh, uh, to represent a Denver area district. And that's, that's, that's three reliable moderates on business issues that uh, I think Senator would agree with me on this that you have there at the center. Um, so really, in, in many ways, the, the Democrats could even grow a seat and, and the Jack Tate seat is very much, uh, in fact, a lot of people I've talked to said that is actually likely to flip to the Democrats um, uh, more so than it is to be stayed in public hands. Um, so you could have as much of a, a 20 to 15 margin for Democrats uh, in which they would have three moderates that could be the swing votes on business issues. Um, you grow larger than that, however, and you really start to go to a more progressive leadership. And, and Fenberg said as much to me, look, you know, uh, we obviously don't want to ram anything through where we start losing portions of our own caucus in voting them forward. But he's like, yeah, whatever comes back, and, and trust me, 1420 is coming back. Back. Not in the same version, um, but in some way they're going to look at 
tax exemptions and decide which ones may be outdated or which ones are not as valuable in providing business to the state as the money they could save uh, and put to education if they eliminate those tax exemptions. And he said, yeah, you know, the margin may determine how progressive that bill is. Uh, he says something's getting through, but it's, it's going to be a lot about, you know, what we can get through our entire caucus. Um, that's just one issue I'll highlight. I don't want to just uh, blabber on and on here, but a couple other things that I think uh, are worth bringing up. Uh, some bills that died last year that could very well come back, that died uh, largely because they ran out of time or they ran into too much controversy at the end. Uh, bills including arbitration reform, uh, bills that would include uh, a measure that was going to presume any worker who caught COVID did so on the job and was eligible for workers' comp insurance, uh, which carries a, a pretty high price tag with it. Um, uh, even, even issues that, that haven't been dug into as much, uh, such as issues around data privacy and what kinds of regulations will be put onto companies to ensure data privacy, uh, of privacy uh, of data that they, uh, they bring in from customers. Um, those will all go before the Senate uh, and the House. Uh, and, and, and how progressive uh, the majority caucuses want to be in pushing them forward is going to be uh, maybe the bigger question than will they push them forward. I think most people view those things as is all coming up in some form or fashion, but but you know that margin matters. Um, now in the House, uh, the margin also matters, but to a different extent. And, and here's why: at 41-24, the Democrats, uh, the more progressive base of the Democrats really had carte blanche in pushing things through. But the truth is there's not a lot of moderates in the House. You would think with bigger numbers, both sides would have more moderates. It's actually not true. Both the Republicans and the uh, the Democrats in the House are actually more toward the conservative and liberal ends of their party uh, than the senators who have to uh, represent a wider district and many of whom come from more competitive districts than the Houses have right there. Um, there are viewed as, as as many as four potential pickup opportunities for Republicans, despite the headwinds that are blowing against them in a year when a, uh, a president whose popularity is underwater right now in the state of Colorado is at the head of the ticket. Um, and, and a lot of that you'll see in the Denver area, uh, representatives uh, Lisa Cutter of Morrison and um, uh, Brianna Satone of Arvada are the two biggest ones. Both of those won seats that, that people didn't think they could win in 2018, a very Democratic year, and they won them when their uh, opponents dropped out of the race, in the middle of the race. They were replaced on the ballot, but uh, they had a great advantage at that point. Uh, both of those are potential Republican pickups, uh, as is a seat in the uh, Pueblo West area, now held by Representative Brie Bonteo, who also won a seat in a very close election in 2018. And some people will say, Tom Sullivan's seat uh, in the Centennial area might be a Republican pickup. Meanwhile, Democrats are really looking at Senator Richard Champion's seat, the Littleton area, uh, as a seat that they can pick up and flip too. So I think anywhere, well, it's a 41-24 split now. Anywhere in the House, you're looking at a 42-23 down to a 37-28 split. And the region that margins matter in the House um, is not because there's going to be a giant cadre of moderates, probably, that will get involved in the same way they do in the Senate but more because it's about the committee makeups. Right now, Democrats have a two to three seats or in the state affairs, a four seat advantage on committees that will ensure that, um, you know, even if some members leave their party's uh, designated uh, desire for a bill, that bill either isn't getting out or isn't getting killed in the committee. You get it down to a one person margin. And I think 37, 28 is about the area where most committees have to be a one person margin at that point. Then it becomes one person who can flip a vote on any given committee. Um, so, uh, so same issues, but I think the Senate is really the, the focus point in terms of what we're going to see uh, coming out, how that's going to look and what kind of issues business will face. So uh, hopefully, Sandra, that's the uh, yeah. oh. uh, not brief overview that you wanted here. Right. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I appreciate that, Ed, and concur in your assessment, um, particularly where there where the pickups lie, um, the threat for Re Republicans to lose the Jack Tate seat. I think is a very fair assessment at this point. Um, 
And um, I think very fascinating that on the House side, to your point, the opportunity for the pickups and the Republicans, obviously no chance of securing majority, but to the degree there can be movement on committee assignments, um, that's a, a huge, huge advantage. And one thing too I, I find notable is with the primary victories that occurred for, on the Republican side with particularly moderates, um, you may begin to see a little bit of, uh, well, you've, you will see some movement in terms of that where in the spectrum, the majority of the Republicans sit, which could create opportunity for, uh, for common some common ground in certain issues. We shall see though, but I think particularly important is the committee makeup ultimately. From your perspective, where do you see, or what have you heard, and I know some others on the call, um, perhaps Nicole can speak to this, but from your perspective, what are you hearing about public option? I know that that's one that we as a chamber have been had been following before um, things shifted. And I'm curious, but I haven't, beyond those within the, the healthcare sector who have concerns about it coming forward, I haven't heard any definitive word that the administration is, is uh, is definitely moving forward with something. Have you heard anything along those lines? I have not, and I had the opportunity to moderate a discussion with um, uh, CDPHE, or excuse me, um, HICPOF, the Healthcare Policy and Financing Department Director, Kim Bimisteffer, and the Insurance Commissioner, Mike Conway, about a month ago. And I asked that same question, and they said, look, we are always looking for ways to give, uh, to bring down insurance costs. Public option is certainly one of those ways but they would not commit to pushing forward to it. And it was interesting because uh, now outgoing uh, House Speaker Casey Becker essentially said the same thing at the end of last session. She said, look, there are bills that will come back next year that we're gonna need to talk about, but public option was not one of those. She said, I don't know that that's the, the end all be all. We will look for ways to reduce healthcare costs. So no, um, the, the administration seems very bent on expanding its yet to be federally improved drug importation program from Canada um, so that it can bring in drugs from more countries uh, across the border and try to lower pharmaceutical costs in that way. But there seems to be almost this stepping back on public option. Like, I don't know that this is where we're going to go. That said, Insurance is going to be a big issue. And in fact, you can, you can bet um, high amounts of money on the fact there will be another pharmaceutical transparency bill that will come back this year. That's another bill that didn't even come up in the post-COVID part of this session. Nobody wanted to argue about that. Nobody thought it was directly linked to COVID and needed to be passed now. Um, but it's an intriguing idea that has never gotten out of the first house before. Um, and because the, everybody agrees with the idea of pharmaceutical transparency, nobody agrees with the details, uh, even within the majority parties on this one. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I mean, public option will be discussed, but I'm not positive we're going to see something like what came up and got its first hearing and passed shortly before the break for coronavirus last year. Yeah, indeed. One of the other considerations for this next legislative session is certainly the economic climate, and as importantly, the state budget as it relates to um, the revenues that are um, short. Uh, we're anticipating approximately a billion dollars short of where we would have otherwise been pre-COVID. Um, and uh, that certainly will have a, a considerable effect on the overall conversations and where the agendas fall. Um, Ed, where are you hearing um, priorities, if you will, for the dollars or, or alternatively, um, who do you see as most vulnerable in the next round of cuts? I, I'm hearing the priorities for the dollars are in, in some ways where they were for the shortened session this year. And that is, look, we, we've got to get to the things most impacted by coronavirus. And that includes uh, taking care of the public health, um, taking care of workers uh, through things like the unemployment insurance trust fund, through things like, you know, adding paid sick leave, which they did last year, um, not the paid family and medical leave that we've been talking about on the long-term basis, but um, you know, six days off that workers can earn each year. Um, and um, Fenberg told me, 
small business. We want to find ways to help small business, whether that's more grants, more loans, expansion of a couple of the programs that they did this year. Um, as far as who's most vulnerable, um, I just finished up a, a week-long series on transportation funding that always came with this caveat. I'd love to talk about this next year. I don't know if we can. I mean, it seems like the efforts that were in there, uh, not infancy, but we're, we're starting to get a little traction at the start of 2020 um, are, are completely put to the side of the road at this point. And I think, uh, I think as far as areas that would have gotten funding had we not seen COVID that won't, I mean, transportation is really in trouble. Although both of the transportation committee chairs had said, look, we want to find some way to move this forward, um, even if not a big package right now. Um, but the other area, just going back to what you said, uh, what we talked about earlier is that tax exemptions are frankly the area that's in trouble. Um, uh, there is going to be a scrubbing of the state's $4 billion in tax exemptions to see what is not considered a high enough priority to continue forward. And it's, you know, it's kind of funny. This has actually been an ongoing process for several years, but most people didn't notice it because the, the, the auditor's office has found a number of tax exemptions uh, that are out of date, that, that serve very little purpose. And the legislature cut four of them last year, um, but they're tax exemptions that had impact somewhere between zero and a couple tens of thousands of dollars because they were so little used. We are going to hear a discussion about the purpose of the enterprise zones. Um, that is uh, for anyone who has business in a um, area of town that is not the most booming area. That's what enterprise zones are for. They're meant to bring jobs uh, to industrial parks, to lower income areas, to areas that have not grown like others. Um, there's been discussion about them for years, uh, but nobody really wanted to touch them. They will be touched next year. It's a matter of how they're going to be changed. Uh, maybe there'll be some tightening on uh, uh, on the conditions of, of, of how far off of the state's median economy you have to be to be considered an enterprise zone. Right now, 80% of Colorado is actually in an enterprise zone. And that's because large swaths of the state, seven, eight, 10 counties in a row, are all enterprise zones in some areas, say the San Luis Valley, say the Eastern Plains. Um, uh, but I think that is that is squarely uh, in, in line of things that are going to get, uh, get hit. And then just in general, tax exemptions too. I mean, there's going to be a question of who's benefiting um, exemptions that that, that are benefiting big and small businesses alike are probably pretty safe. Uh, exemptions that seem more geared to larger businesses are probably a little closer to being in trouble. Um, but again, it's it's a, it's going to depend a lot on the the outcome of this year's elections. Um, you know, if uh, if if say you know Rachel Zensinger and, and James Coleman can still have a heavy hand in these negotiations. I don't know. I, the, the talks will shift. It's just a matter of how much. Um, but that's, I don't think they're, they're looking at cuts to a particular area of government so much as cuts to tax cuts that are, are really going to be at issue here. Yeah, indeed, I would agree. And, you know, many of um, the small businesses that you mentioned that are uh, leadership has indicated a desire to help in future um, relief packages are those who exist in enterprise zones. Um, and to the extent folks, they are taking advantage of it. Certainly it's sort of um, an unfortunate possible trade-off, if you will, of, of benefit um, or detriment in both ways. So that'll be an interesting dynamic to determine who, who are the beneficiaries of, of an enterprise zone program versus who remain needing additional assistance um, and balancing that out. I'm going to open it up to some questions for folks um, who may have them for Ed and um, as we look forward to the next legislative session. Any questions, thoughts? So I have one and I, I put it in the chat, but it kind of showed up as a hot mess. So sorry about that. Um, but I was just wondering, Ed, if you can um, kindly speak to um, what implications you think the ballot measures could potentially have on the budget, primarily um, you know, the income tax reduction that's polling very favorably, um, EE, Gallagher, any of those that you might shift some light on? 
Yeah, absolutely. Because there's a couple major um, uh, in, uh, effects here of the ballot measures. Um, the one I will start out with, because it won't really have an impact in the budget, is the paid family medical leave measure. That's going to be an enterprise. If voters uh, agree to pass that, um, that is going to be completely funded uh, from employers and employees. It's going to be a 0.9% fee on uh, every uh uh, paycheck in the state. Um, and so that is not going to affect the state budget so much. If it doesn't pass, then we're likely going to hear more discussion about alternate ways to deal with paid family medical leave, though, and who knows what impact that's going to have on the budget. Um, as far as Proposition 116 goes, this is the one that would cut the state's income tax um, by, uh, by a small amount of uh, uh, from, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm not thinking right here. I believe it's 5.63 or 4.63 percent to 4.55 percent. Thank you. Um, uh, that will have a $154 million impact on next year's state budget if that passes. Um, it, it's not coming out of anywhere in particular. There are questions about, you know, where would it come from? Uh, opponents of the um, Income tax cut say it's going to be terrible wherever it comes from. Proponents say it's 154 million in a uh, what's going to be a 12 billion dollar uh, general but fund budget again. We can find the money. Uh, so, but either way, that's money that will not be in the budget uh, for next year. Um, uh, I'm not going to lie. I have not done a lot of work on Proposition EE, so I cannot tell you exactly what that uh, tax hike on cigarettes, tobacco, vaping is going to do. So. I apologize for that. Um, as far as uh, Gallagher goes, that is that is one of the most unique um, uh, impacts in the budget. Uh, if voters decide that we are going to roll back and get rid of a 38-year-old property tax law uh, that sets uh, business, uh, that requires business property to pay 55% of all property tax bills in the state uh, at a time when 80% of all property taxes uh, come from resident, you know, property tax value of land comes from residential value. Um, uh, it's it could have multiple impacts, um, but the reason this was pushed in a bipartisan fashion onto the ballot is because the, the sure impact uh, if if Amendment B does not pass and does not repeal the Gallagher Amendment uh, is this uh, property um, property tax mill levy rates um, or property tax assessment ratios. Excuse me on residential property will go down again. Right now, residential property pays on 7.15% of its value. They will go down to uh, an estimated 5.88%. Uh, what that means, and, and the reason they're doing that is because business property is actually losing money uh, right now. It's, it's less valuable because of the uh, recession we're in, uh, whereas residential property is still going up. I mean, uh, we just had a story today that the average Denver home is now selling in four days and, and 600,000 thousand dollars was the average price in July. Um, and so because the Gallagher Amendment requires uh, oh. residential properties to pay a minority of the overall property tax assessment, uh, overall taxes going into the state, that means that areas that are very heavy in residential, whether these be suburbs, uh, even areas on more rural uh, parts of the state, uh, will see less money coming in. And the state is going to have to backfill the money that their schools and their county governments are losing. Um, and that means there's going to be less money available for the overall general fund because the state's got to start getting into backfilling that money as well. So um, it's, it's if Amendment B passes and we repeal the Gallagher Amendment, uh, there will probably be less impact on the budget next year because the budget will look a little bit more like you could predict it looking right now. Um, if it fails uh, and and certainly a number of, of, of homeowners are, are hoping it does, uh, then, um, then you're going to see less money available for programs as a whole. So that was a big mishmash of things. Um, that, so I'm sorry if that was, uh, if I've lost everyone or put you all to sleep. Uh, I'm gonna add one more though, and that's Proposition 117, which would uh, limit the state's use of new enterprise funds where you put a fee on a specific area uh, to fund a new program. Um, and the reason that is important is because any transportation talks that are going on right now about increasing transportation funding are going to involve putting fees on uh, Uber 
Uber and Lyft and Amazon deliveries and autonomous vehicles when they come about, uh, as well as increasing electric vehicle fees, as most people don't feel they're paying their way at this point since they don't have to pay the gas tax. Um, uh, if Proposition 117 passes, um, uh, both business leaders and, and, uh, and opponents of, uh, of the measure have said, that's going to cause problems trying to get to a deal that involves both uh, general fund money, tax hikes, and fee hikes uh, for transportation funding. So that just throws a whole other wrench into the budget, at least on transportation funding. Great question, Nicole. And it really is remarkable how much, how many components of the ballot initiatives this year do intersect with the budget. Um, we haven't, I don't believe my recollection, I don't think we've seen that type of multitude multipliers, if you will, into the effect on the budget as we have this cycle. So um, Ed, for your rec, for your information, um, the Women's Chamber has taken a position in favor of referendum B, um, in favor of referendum EE, and opposed to family at 118, the Family Medical Leave Act. Okay, okay. There's three, I think, Debbie, correct me, or Louise, um, I think those, just those three, right? <laughs> um, any other questions? That's that right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, any other questions that are pressing for you all? Well, I am. Uh, I really want to thank Ed so much for joining. You can see why he I invite him to participate in these types of conversations because his knowledge around the issues, the political landscape is unparalleled in my mind. And um, so greatly appreciate the opportunity to um, hear your thoughts, Ed, and to always work with you. And, um, and thank you. Um, anything can else? Can I just ask one quick little yeah, question? At the risk of exposing myself as being completely lost and and really shouldn't be, um, Ed, you mentioned that the paid family leave will not impact the budget because it's an enterprise. But my understanding is that even though it's an enterprise, the state has to contribute their 50% to cover all the state employees. So doesn't that, of course, Thank hit the budget? Yes, thank you. And that, that is a good point. And I had forgotten about that. Um, the, but no collections will happen on paychecks until 2023. Right. So it, it, it is going to be a budget issue for the state eventually when you're contributing uh, half of the money needed to fund all 32,000 of the state employees or however many there are at this point. Um, but uh, but it's, it's a future budget issue more than an immediate budget issue. Good, mm -hmm. good question, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Good point, Diana. Um, an additional burden upon the state budget. Great. Do you have any closing thoughts, Ed, before we uh, let you depart? No, no. I mean, other other than please study up on the issues uh, and 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 vote. Um, and I will say, and I just was thinking this, um, although now I'm thinking you all probably noticed, I noticed there was a number of people from oil and gas firms uh, who were on this call. And, and and you've probably heard this already, you don't need to tell you, but I hear that for once, that is not going to be a major issue at this point. Uh, it seems like the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission has pretty much taken over uh, doing all the things that they want to do uh, with regard to oil and gas. So uh, for once, that is not really an election issue, um, but uh, but we'll see if that changes. So. I appreciate your mentioning that, and of course, many of those on the phone, as you as you pointed out, are from the industry. I've been paying close attention to that as well, and I think the large concern from the industry is that there are additional um, steps made. Um, we've heard we had heard from many progressive groups or anti fractivists if you will, um, indicating through the process, a preference to see more authority granted to the COGCC to do more. Um, so it's interesting. I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that you're not hearing much by way of um, legislative leadership pursuing anything. I think that's been a concern of many in the industry that there could be. More. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I, 
we have another reporter who covers COGCC, but it doesn't seem like they're holding back much in terms of what they're not getting into right now. So uh, that's that's been the general attitude that I've heard. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, folks like Steve Fenberg, who was the co-author of Senate Bill 181, uh, creating this new COGCC, uh, seem to be more focused on how do we find money to find fund education at this point. They they rather than how do we put more regulations on oil and gas. That's good, that's good. The only caveat to that perhaps is the greenhouse gas roadmap, um, which is uh, my expectation is there is a desire for additional teeth um, and ex to execute upon some of that roadmap stuff. So there's um, perhaps a higher level umbrella approach to some of these policies that have intersex um, and ultimately affect the overall revenue of the state because of the impact oil and gas industry that has contributed so much to the state in terms of revenue on at multiple levels and certainly um, again gets back to Gallagher and so forth. So there's multiple um, levels of, of I guess layers of impact of that larger agenda item related to a, a, a addressing climate change. So. That's just another whole another issue altogether, but there, but it trickles all the way down to the ability to accomplish other agenda items that perhaps the legislative leadership wants to pursue. Yes, so. it's, it's, it's a worthwhile point. Although I think that uh, if they're gonna put teeth to the green climate map, um, they're gonna look for areas outside of oil and gas. And the reason is because they put a lot of regulations in place. And right. I remember a 2019 press conference when I spoke to CDPHE leaders who said, we need to go after uh, emissions from like construction sites. So yeah. I, I think you, could, you certainly could see progress in that, but it'll be less focused on the natural resources industry and more focused on other areas of greenhouse gas emissions, I think. Yeah. Good point. That's very fair. That's perfect. Good so. point. Well, cool. We, I could have this conversation with Ed all day about what's coming, as you and can see. we're going to have it for four months when the legislative <laughs> starts. Exactly, exactly. But again, I so appreciate, Ed, you're joining us and sharing your thoughts and um, and the feedback from, from the group. We'll let you go and uh, move on to your next Zoom call, invariably. And, um, and again, appreciate your time. And we've got an update from Louise and Trisha. You're welcome to stay and listen to some of that, Ed, but you're also free to go. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, well, thank you all for um, taking that time to listen and, and converse with Ed. Would love to get um, Trisha and Louise's perspective on the ballot questions that we've engaged in which we've engaged. Um, Sandra, thanks for setting that up with Ed. That was super, super helpful. And uh, let's see, Trisha and I have been sharing um, recent polling data with one another in preparation for update for today. And um, we'll drop some links into the chat in a moment as well. Um, but the University of Colorado um, just released their latest polling yesterday. Um, based on voter input from um, earlier this month. And they're showing that for the Gallagher Amendment, which of course you all remember, we took a passive support position on um, Amendment B to repeal the Gallagher Amendment. Um, we're showing in this latest poll that about 44% 44 of, re of respondents are showing their support for Amendment B to repeal. Um, but this has some of the highest numbers across all of the statewide ballot measures they um, included in the poll, highest numbers of voters who are unsure of how they will vote. And I think that that speaks to the level of complexity of the issue. And we're, we heard that in some of Ed's discussion of it. Um, we've certainly tackled that with um, this committee as well. And it consistently is um, one of the ballot measures that in all of my conversations with various audiences about this, we're getting the most questions on because it's just so complicated. And so I think that one is um, hard to predict at this point, but with so much uncertainty, I think we all know that um, voters tend to either skip it or vote no if they don't understand what a yes vote would actually do. Yeah. Um, Trisha, more to add on Amendment B and what you're hearing? Um, well, just um, <clears throat> another poll, the uh, Colorado Politics 9 News 
uh, survey that was out in the field about the same time as the CU poll at the beginning of the month just echoes this same thing, but I thought a pretty astounding number in that one is that 61% of respondents replied that they were unsure on how they would vote. So that just, again, um, solidifies the fact that people don't know what they're gonna do on this one, um, which as uh, Louise said, often inclines voters to either skip it in, like entirely or vote no. Uh, it does seem from uh, recent polling, both from the um, Nine News poll that Trisha mentioned and the CU poll um, that I was referencing earlier, that voters are um, more defined in which way they plan to vote on Prop 118, the paid family and medical leave insurance program. And um, the support numbers are stronger for that measure than any of the others that we've seen in statewide ballot measure polling with 65% of voters um, indicating that they plan to, uh, or we're definitely going to vote yes on Prop 118. So it looks like if we are confident in the accuracy of these polls and the way that um, it's all going to shake out um, as we get the results on November 4th, that Prop 118 is likely to pass. Um, I had a harder time tracking down recent polling information for Prop EE. So before we switch to some more contextual discussion of Prop EE, um, Trisha, are you hearing um, more or different um, news on the, the shape of Prop 118? No. Um, uh, are you guys getting feedback on me? Okay. That's better now. Better now? <laughs> Okay, um, no, just reiterating the same. There's what I've seen in polling results. Um, overwhelming majority of voters are in favor of Prop 118 and paid family medical leave. Um, so again, just echoing what that CU poll and Nine News uh, study have found. Um, it's relatively surprise to no one um, partisan split with a lot of Democrats in favor and um, Republicans opposed. And with Prop EE, I don't think there's been as much um, invested in the, um, the polling figures uh, for Prop EE, but I think we've all probably um, received mailers, seen billboards, uh, encountered advertisements of some sort for or against um, Prop EE. And I think what we're seeing is that both sides of this campaign are well-funded and heavily invested in, um, in trying to sway the way that voters are understanding the issue and then of course will um, we'll cast their ballot. Um, I, I wish I had a clearer picture of uh, how this is taking shape right now to share with the group. Um, I think at one point earlier in the campaign, there was a higher level of confidence for those working to, um, to pass it. Um, but sort of later in the game, um, there was quite a bit of investment made in the no on EE campaign and um, the, the billboards that we've seen all around town saying, you know, say no to the tax hike. Um, really do distill it down into a simple yes or no about taxes without the nuance that was so important in our committees and, and the CWCC's board, board's consideration of the issue and how important it is um, for funding of early childhood resources that help keep working families working. Uh, in economic times like these, um, I think that the the messages about not approving an increase in taxes will be pretty persuasive to folks who are feeling a pinch in their own pocketbooks. Trisha or Sandra, more perspective to add on EE? Um, I, I really haven't heard much about EE. Um, one survey result that I did want to flag pivoting away from, it's not ballot measure related, um, but election day related, and I think pertinent to businesses, particularly those who have office spaces um, downtown and staff coming into those office spaces. Unprecedented, um, the CU poll found that 77% of Coloradans are concerned about violence on election day or the day after. Um, and I do have a network contact that was on a US um, chamber call saying that they were advising businesses to have a contingency plan for election day or the day after in case there is unrest. And I thought that is something um, worth flagging for folks on the call um, as business, 
might want to be prepared for that day, um, things to be a little unsettled. That's un so, I mean, yeah, I've read the same and it's, it's unfortunate to hear, but it's the times we're living in. Thank you both Trisha and Louise for your insights on that. I'm gonna pass it back to Debbie. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna turn off the recording. I'll probably just 